So let me introduce Sally Hogshead. So Sally Hogshead is the author of the book Fascinate and the creator of the website howtofascinate.com. And she's going to talk to us all about uh, seven triggers tonight. Sally Hogshead. Thank you. Nothing dead. Hi. I, thank you for coming tonight. This is extraordinary for me to be able to share this with you. I'm going to be sharing some ideas with you that I've never given away before. You guys are sort of like my, my little beta group. So I'm, I'm really excited to be able to share this with you. First of all, let me ask. Raise your hand if you think that you're a better driver than most people. Okay, now look around. Thank you. Now, raise your hand if you think that you're more fascinating than most people. <laughs> it's funny how people overestimate themselves. <laughs> so here's what we learn in our research. We all know a bell curve. And we all know that logically, 50% of us are going to be above average, 50% are going to be below average. But when we asked people in our research, when we said, are you more attractive than most people? 60% of you would say, yes, I'm more attractive than the average person. And if we asked you, are you a better driver? 80% of you say, yes, I'm a better driver. And it gets worse. If we say, are you more intelligent? 90% of you say, yes, I'm more intelligent. So we totally overestimate our abilities in these, in these areas. But on the other hand, when we did a quantitative study and we said, are you more fascinating? Only 39% of people said they're more fascinating than most. Why is that? Why do we so grossly overestimate what we're capable of when it comes to driving and intelligence, but we underestimate ourselves when it comes to the ability to connect? What does that say about us? That we either don't want to admit it or we don't want to own it. And I think I can tell you why. I'd like to propose that on the day that you were born, that you were already fascinating, that you already knew exactly how to fascinate, that you were born with it. But somewhere over the course of your life, you forget it or you stop doing it. I want to propose that you don't learn how to be fascinating. You unlearn over the course of your life, how to be boring. And it happens in a moment, that there's one moment in your life in which you made a decision. And I want you to start thinking back. I want you to think back through your childhood. Was there a moment when you made a decision to stop being fascinating? Because I know exactly when it happened to me. I grew up with the last name Hogshead. <laughs> and if you can think of how bad that would be on the playground. I promise you, it was worse. And thank God my parents set up, you know, the therapy trust fund. Because not only did I grow up with the last name Hogshead, but when I was seven, my sister was the number one ranked swimmer in the whole world. The same year, my brother went to Harvard. I was seven. Finger painting? And not only was my sister the number one swimmer, but she went on to the Olympics to win three gold medals in the Olympics in swimming. No pressure. Yeah, I know. I'm the underachiever of the family. No pressure at all. And did I mention my brother went to Harvard? And then I was seven, and then I could finger paint? So I was thinking to myself, I thought, well, what could I do that's fascinating? You know, my sister's got the whole athletic thing. My brother's got the whole academic thing. What could I do? How could I be fascinating? So I thought, well, I'm going to go into dance, you know, I'm going to do a little tap, a little jazz. And I really wasn't very good. But I brought a lot of personality to it. And, um, and my teacher said to me, you know, you're really not very good, but you bring a lot of personality to it. And so I, I remember I had, she, there was this awesome night where she gave me a solo in the dance recital. And, um, and I actually have a picture of it. This was me in my dance recital. Thank you. And she named. She named the dance Miss Personality because I wasn't very good, but I did have personality. And I remember this night so clearly. I, 
I remember the it was you know a, it was it felt like a million people, but it was it was probably as many people as are here. But the music started, and I went out on the stage, and I totally forgot my dance steps. Have you ever had that happen? Your brain just goes completely blank. And I remember thinking in that moment, you know, this was going to be my moment. This was going to be my chance to be fascinating for once. I was going to be the fascinating one. And I remember thinking to myself, this is dangerous. This is scary. I was, it, was, it, was a, it, was a, it, it was a moment that I will never forget because I remember the music played on and then they turned it off and then the spotlight went off and I saw my mother cover her mouth and I got off stage. And in that moment, I decided that it was better to be safe, that it was better to not be fascinating, it was better to follow the rules, it was better to not stand out, but to, to fit in. And what I want to tell you tonight is, I think there was a moment in your life that the same thing happened. I think there was somewhere along the way that you tried out for a team and you didn't make it, you wanted to be on student council and you weren't voted in, you wrote an essay, you poured your heart into a story that was marked up with red ink. I think something happened somewhere along the way for all of us. And the goal is not to learn how to be fascinating, it's to unlearn how to be boring. And so for me, my last name is Hogshead, but now my business card says, a Hogshead is a barrel that holds 62 gallons, so what's your last name, smartass? So let's talk about this concept of fascination. What, what is fascination exactly? You know, I spent a lot of time studying the science of fascination. What I found is that fascination is the most intense type of emotional focus. And over the course of all this, the, the study that I did in neurology and history and psychology and biological anthropology, I found that there are two things that I can tell you absolutely for sure about your brain and fascination. The first thing is that your brain is hardwired to be fascinating. You're hardwired to fascinate other people, that in your personality, you were already born with everything you need to be persuasive and captivating. I don't have to teach that to you. You already have it in there. It's just your job to identify it and express it. The second thing that I can tell you for sure about your brain is that your brain is hardwired to be fascinated. It feels really good to be fascinated. You know, when you're, in the, when you're completely in that zone. You know, when you're reading a book and you lose, you lose track of time and everything around you and you stop thinking about your to-do list and you're totally immersed, whether it's a television show or a conversation with a friend or time that you're spending with your pet, whatever it is, that you're totally in that moment. Athletes call this being in the zone. When you're fascinated, your brain is actually performing at the very highest capacity. These are your maximum moments of creativity and performance. So the goal is, first of all, to recognize the way in which your personality is fascinating, and second of all, to figure out how can you have more moments of being fascinated, and how can you give these to other people. When I looked back on what the origin of this was, I saw that in, a, in an academic journal that was actually published in a, in, a, in, a, in a printed piece. Remember those printed, <laughs> printed pieces made out of molecules? It's crazy. I found a little paragraph about fascination that was what unlocked the concept of fascinate for me. I found that one of the oldest words in written language is fascinare, which means to bewitch or hold captive. It means that you, when you, when you, when you fascinate somebody, Right, it's almost like you're hypnotizing them. You, it's, you, you bind them to you so closely that they lose the ability to resist. They lose rational thought. And throughout history, if you look at it over time, all the way from the ancient Romans, they talk about fascination as an evil curse. The fascination was the most powerful force there was. They had a god for it, Fascinus. And Fascinus was worshipped with 30 vestal virgins. Now, I don't know about you, but I was dying to know. It's like, what are Vestal Virgins? You hear about this all the time. So I looked it up. Vestal Virgins had to remain virgins until they were 30 years old, which is a total buzzkill. If you figure the average life expectancy was like 26, <laughs> what fun is that? But if you go throughout history, 
all the way from the Romans who worshiped Fascinus, all the way through to the, the Greek shepherds in 280 BC, all the way through to the European Renaissance, Constantinople, Mesopotamia, all the way through to the Salem witch trials, which were not about witchcraft. The Salem witch trials were about fascination, about binding somebody so closely that they couldn't make a decision for themselves because you had so connected with them. All the way up until Freud in 1921. And then we stop hearing about fascination in the history books, this, this powerful force of connection. It's almost as though it ends when marketing was invented. As soon as marketing showed up on the scene, we quit talking about the natural instinctive triggers that people have that we can use to persuade and influence each other. And we started talking about things like strategic briefs and, and creatives and then God invented planners. And we went on from there. But I want to propose that marketing is artificial. Marketing is a bolted on set of tools that were invented in the 20th century and we don't need to use artificial means to create this connection that we can just go back or we can just look throughout history it's already all there we can go back and look at human nature to understand all the way from 2000 years ago how we persuade and captivate and that's what this emotional focus is that's what fascination is you know this feeling you know that feeling when you're being fascinating, when you're standing in front of a presentation and people are completely captivated by what you're saying. They're not thinking about their to-do list. They're not thinking about what they're gonna have for dinner. They're thinking about you and your message. And it's in these moments when you're fascinating somebody that you actually have the power to change their life. That if people are distracted when you're trying to talk to them, if people are distracted, you don't have the ability to change their behavior because they're not thinking about you, they're thinking about something else. If you want to change somebody's behavior, if you want to persuade them, you must understand how to first fascinate them. When I, when, when I started looking at this, one of the most interesting pieces that I found was that the feeling of being fascinated is actually very much like the feeling of falling in love. That if you look at the brain chemistry between somebody who's fascinated, who's totally in that flow, who's in that zone, it's almost exactly the same as somebody who is infatuated because the barriers drop and the, you, there's instant connection. So I started researching this. I wanted to understand, well, what is it about this feeling of falling in love and how can we fascinate in a way that consciously harnesses this? So I went to the very epicenter of the fascination battle royale. Do you want to see? Online dating. I want to propose that online dating is really exactly like your business. You have to attract the prospect, close the sale, build a long and lasting emotional connection. And that's what everybody in this room has to do, right? Attract the prospect, close the sale, build an emotional connection. And so I went online and I, I created a fake account and I was all excited because <laughs> I was going to say, well, you know, like what would guys have to say to me? when I went out there, so I was like, okay, if, if the stakes are so high here that a man is trying to find his number one beloved, well, obviously he's gonna put his A game into it, right? You know, he's, this is gonna be like the very best fascination that he has to offer. So I put my account out there and here's what I got. I especially like, Let's get it on. <laughs> Although I was tempted to write back the guy that said, get it while it's hot. <laughs> but let's take a minute. Let's take a look over here. Let's take a look over here at this guy right here. We'll call him Ed. Now, Ed is not a bad looking guy, but Ed has a real problem. He's kind of handicapped by the fact that he's using the word high as his means of introduction. I mean, he's competing against 13 million other guys for my attention, and he, all he comes out with is high, which is basically the gap khakis of online dating. <laughs> so here's the problem. Ed is on a search 
for his beloved. Ed wants to find the one woman among 13 million women. He wants to find the one woman who's going to live happily ever after with him. And all he's got to compete with is high. Is that going to be enough to be able to break through? Because the problem is that Ed faces competition. He faces a lot of competition. And Ed's a good looking guy, but he's not the best looking guy on the site. You know, if you're the best looking guy on the website, it's sort of like you can be, you can have the best advertising or the biggest marketing budget. If you're the of something, then you don't have to be the most fascinating. But here's the problem. There's probably a woman on this website is perfect for Ed. He could probably find his beloved somewhere on Match.com, but it's not enough for Ed to be the best boyfriend if she doesn't see it. Just like it's not enough for you to create the best advertising if nobody sees it. It's not enough for you to write the best blogs if nobody reads it. It's not enough for you to manufacture the best cars if nobody buys them. It's not enough for you to be the best politician. Being the best is not enough. It's not enough to have higher standards and deliver more. It's only enough if people know about it. It used to be enough to be the best. It's not enough anymore if you fail to fascinate. Quality is not enough. And the problem is that it's not just that Ed faces competition. Ed has a bigger problem, and that problem is distraction. Because the BBC just released a report that the average attention span now, thanks to web browsing, is approximately nine seconds. Nine seconds. Nine seconds is the same attention span as a goldfish. So here's you talking to people. This is your customer. These are your employees. These are your kids. And you're trying to get their attention. And you have nine seconds, nine seconds to make an introduction, nine seconds to make a connection, nine seconds to build a relationship. And if you fail in that nine seconds, you may never get another chance. Raise your hand if you find that a little bit scary. <laughs> I find that really scary. But here's the thing. Relationships don't happen in nine seconds. And loyalty and love don't happen in nine seconds. But introductions do. Introductions happen in nine seconds every day. You make decisions in nine seconds all the time. So the whole purpose of fascination is to open that door, is to create that opening in the nine seconds so you can get on to the next nine seconds and the next nine seconds, so that you can create that lasting emotional loyalty and that relationship so that you can have all of these things that you want out of your relationships, out of your clients, out of your customers, out of your employees, your boss, your kids, everybody in your life that you want to fascinate. You have to get past that nine seconds to begin. And up until now, as people, we've had one tool to be able to do that, and that tool is called a personal brand. But here's the problem with a personal brand. I want to propose that we've outgrown personal branding. Now, personal branding was invented in the late 90s, and it was an excellent tool. It's outstanding if you're in your 20s. If you're just out of college, you need to figure out who you are, how to have the right resume and the right suit and the right way to shake hands. Personal branding is excellent. But the problem is that as you go along in your career, your career should not be built on a set of one-size-fits-all tools. Because every person in this room, according to personal branding books, and by the way, I've written one. It was published in 2005. Everybody in this room, theoretically, should be following the same rules according to personal branding. And I just think that's inherently flawed. I think that there's something else. I call it a personality brand, which is your brand should be built on your personality, on the inherent strengths of your personality, of what you bring to the party. And that's what I want to show you tonight. I want to show you how do you identify this personality brand. So instead of relying on the personal brand that you can sell yourself and you can communicate yourself in a different way. But first let's take a look at, at the ways in which, how can you know if your personal brand is obsolete? Well, first of all, your personal brand is obsolete if it's artificially manufactured to create an impression. 
Your personal brand is obsolete if you can't communicate who you are and how you add value. See, this is the problem, I'm sorry, the problem with personal branding is that it tells you to be outstanding, but it doesn't tell you how. It tells you to be memorable, but it doesn't tell you how. Well, how am I memorable? How am I remarkable and outstanding? Personal branding can't help me get from here to there. It's built on a set of one-size-fits-all techniques. Your personal brand is obsolete if it doesn't reflect who you are at the top of your game. You know, your personal brand should not be about who, who you are at the base level of how to hand out a business card or how to design the logo on your website. Your personal brand is obsolete if it's designed to maximize your profit rather than your purpose. And then finally, if it's based on what your audience wants you to be rather than who you really are. Never build your brand on what somebody else wants you to be. That's the difference between a corporate brand and a human being. A corporate brand can be artificially bolted on for its customers. Human being should never be built around what other people want it to be. So when I looked at this and I looked at, well, what is it? What is it that's hardwired within us, within our personalities? You know, the, the biggest problem that we have is the same one that Ed faces, which is competition and distraction. So when somebody says to you, pay attention over here. If you have to focus on something, your brain says, should I pay attention? There's part of your brain that's thinking of all this huge myriad of things that you could potentially pay attention to. So your brain has to make a decision. And our goal, if we want to get through that door, if we want to break through that nine seconds, is to immediately get from should I pay attention to the yes. And that's where the system of seven triggers was originally built, was how do you get to yes? How do you immediately captivate somebody? So let's go through this system. Now here's what I want you to know about this system, is that this is not just about branding. That this is, this is, a, this is a, it's a method, it's a roadmap. Anytime you have any kind of a communication challenge, you can apply these seven different steps very methodically. And I'm gonna take you through tonight very methodically exactly how to apply this to any type of communication. So first of all, there's power. Now, when I wrote Fascinate, Fascinate was originally written for brands and messages. But here's what I learned. The book came out last year in 2010. And what I learned was that actually human beings are much more fascinating to me than brands. That really what I wanted to study was, well, how do you make a, a person more fascinating? So today I'm going to be taking you through this, not from the way the book is written. I'm going to be taking it through you from our newest research, which is how human brands are built. So power people fascinate by taking command of the environment. They're decisive, they're opinionated, they're authoritative. They immediately earn our notice because they instantly have influence. People with the passion trigger, they attract with emotion, they tend to be very social, they are communicative, they're intuitive, meaning they're right brain, they tend to be more creative, they tend to instantly connect with others, they have very low barriers, which means they're transparent, so we can read their body language quickly, we can read in their eyes what they're thinking. People often say, oh, it's almost like they're an open book. Next, people with mystique. People with mystique have complexity. They don't tell us everything they're thinking. They tend to be a little bit more goal-oriented than a lot of the other triggers. For example, if you have a passion person, the passion person wants to bounce into your office and tell you everything that happened over the course of the weekend, and let's participate, and let's play, and let's go out for drinks after work. <laughs> the mystique person's gonna come at it very differently. The mystique person is much more, much more focused on the result. They're not gonna put everything on the table. They tend to hate drama. They don't want to know how the sausage is made. They don't want to know everything that came up in your little drama queen life. <laughs> they want to focus on what's the result and how are you going to get there. Next are prestige. Prestige people, people with prestige as their primary trigger are, are very focused on how they're, going to, how they're going to elevate their goals. And in doing so, they earn our respect. Because we can always look at a prestige person and know that they can see how things can be better that they can actually see ways of improving the environment or improving a scenario that others of us can't necessarily see. They're also very difficult to satisfy for that reason. You know, they can be intimidating because they're always looking at how things can be better. Next are alarm. Alarm people are very cautious because they're protecting us. They're very focused on the deadlines, on the structure, 
Um, I need an alarm person on my team. I'm a primary passion. I have to have an alarm person on my team or the project isn't going to be done on budget and on time. Yep. So it's, it's, th there's, no one, there's no one trigger combination that's better than another. It's just for the, for the use, for the purpose that you're doing it for. Then there's rebellion. <laughs> Rebellion's a personal favorite of mine because it's the root of all creativity. All creativity, all innovation comes from the rebellion trigger because you have to know what something is before you can be creative and change it into something else. And then finally, there's the trust trigger. We love trust people because they make us feel stable, they make us feel comfortable, they make us feel good because we know exactly what they're going to do. They're, they're reliable, they're dependable, they tend to be routine oriented, they like to structure their day the exact same way over and over again. We always know they're going to be reading the paper, drinking their coffee, going to work. Now the downside, like every trigger, the trust trigger has a downside. And the downside in this case is that these folks tend to be a little bit more predictable. So we don't see them necessarily in the creativity roles. We don't necessarily sometimes even see them in leadership roles because they get so focused sometimes on doing things the same way that they don't innovate and try to find a different way of doing it. So, so you have these seven different ways to fascinate. But let's take a look. Oh, there are two things that I just wanna, I wanna mention. Originally when I wrote the book, there were two triggers that we've changed. And actually we're coming out with a new version of the book. It'll be coming out in 2012. It's a revised edition. So if you have the original version, keep it. It's like you know the first edition of a stamp. You'll be able to sell it on eBay for like 20 bucks soon. <laughs> Originally when I wrote the book, I wrote it because I wrote it for brands, I had two triggers, lust and vice. Lust was about the ability to pull things in, like I lust for a pair of Jimmy Choo's, or I lust for chocolate. But what I learned is people are very different. People don't necessarily pull in. They use passion to attract. And then second, vice. Vice was about tweaking the rules, about finding a different way of going about things. But people don't necessarily use vice, they use creativity or rebellion. So just keep in mind if you've read the book. So let's take a look. Now, one of the most difficult challenges that I have in my life in persuasion is, is not a traditional marketing challenge, it's to get my kids to eat their green vegetables. <laughs> Does anybody else have this problem? Is it just me? Yeah, they never, they never want to eat the broccoli. So what could we do using the seven triggers to get our kids to eat their vegetables? Well, let's go through this quickly. So with power, I would say, eat your vegetables now. With passion, I might take that broccoli and I would chop it up and I would put it on the plate and I would drizzle some cheese sauce over it and say, let's eat the broccoli. <laughs> then if I was going to use mystique, I would say, I have a great game in mind, but I'm only going to play it with you if you eat your broccoli. So I'd make them curious. Or I could use prestige. I could take my kids and I could pit them against each other and say, okay, who's going to be the broccoli eating champion? Then I could use alarm, which is the classic parental maneuver of saying, if you don't eat your broccoli, then you don't get dessert. <laughs> or I could use rebellion, where I would say, fine, we don't have to eat broccoli. How about Brussels sprouts? <laughs> or I could use trust. Now with trust, I would bind them close to me, and I would say, I know you don't love the broccoli, but if you eat the broccoli, then I'll give you a warm bath, and I'll read you a story, and I'll wrap you in your blanket, and I'll put you to bed. So we can use this system of seven triggers to apply to just about anything. Let's take a look with your customers. Now, you, you don't necessarily have all your customers do the F score, I understand that, but you can kind of intuit what somebody's triggers are gonna be. So let's take a look at how this would work. How would you use the seven triggers for seven different types of customers? If your customer has a primary power trigger, if their focus is on power, do not micromanage them, do not talk down to them, do not patronize them. What you want to do is make sure that you give them the tools to be able to make the decision. You want to allow them to feel as though they're going to be in power. You want to take an optimistic, bullish stance, but stand back and don't get in a power struggle. If, you're, if your consumer uses the passion trigger, it's critical that you communicate the way in which you are emotionally invested in the relationship. It's better to do the communication in person. Don't do it over phone or email because they want to be able to see in your contact how you feel about it. With the mystique trigger, if your customer has the mystique, make sure that you don't push them with a hard sell because they'll back away immediately. Just give them the rational facts and data and then stand back and let them make a decision. If they're about prestige, you have to list for them the ways in which their life is going to be better or their results are going to be improved by working with you. 
If, they're, if their primary trigger is alarm, outline the negative consequences. Tell them everything that could potentially go wrong and how you are the solution to those problems. If their primary trigger is rebellion, give them a lot of options because they like the creativity. They like to be able to choose. They don't want to be boxed in. So don't just give them one way of solving it. And finally, if it's about trust, you must demonstrate your commitment over time. You have to show them how this is going to be a stable relationship that will go years into the future. So do something like a satisfaction guarantee. So now let me ask you, I want you all to take out a piece of paper. We're going to be doing an exercise later, so this, is, this will be preemptive. I want you to take out a piece of paper and I want to write down, I want you to write down, give me one situation in which you want to be able to fascinate. One situation in which you want to be able to fascinate with your boss or your client or a customer or something else. I'm going to give you just a moment, write down your example. See how I did that? That was the power trigger. Write down your example. Eat your vegetables now. <clears throat> Brian, can I trouble you for, for a bottle of water? <coughs> this is going to be clinky. <coughs> okay. So let's go through. Oh. So we just published, we just produced these um, super fabulous gifts for anybody who raises their hand and gives me an example. Thank you. <gasps> Double so fisting. What, I have a choice? Yeah. Prestige. I get to choose. <laughs> so Brian is making me feel special. Mystique. Which one is warm and which one is cold? Mm. Alarm. I want the cold one, but I may choose the warm one. <laughs> Trust. I know you're going to give me the warm one. <laughs> the cold one. Is it this one? That's room temperature. This is cold. Oh, trades. Okay. okay. So. Okay. So. Somebody raise your hand and give me an example of how you would want to apply the seven triggers to solve a communication problem. Yes. Can, can I ask you to stand up? Sure. Delivering a webinar. Delivering a webinar. Excellent. First of all, here you go. Thank you me. are going to know exactly how to be fascinating because you raised your hand and they did not. <laughs> there you go. What's your name? Flora. Yeah. Flora? Flora. Laura, it's good to meet you. Flora. See, Flora is way more fascinating. Thank you. OK, so if you were going to deliver a webinar, the first thing you would want to do with the power trigger is you want to make sure that you have an opinion of authority. You must come to this webinar now because we know more than anybody else does. An opinion of authority is a way of being able to take your expertise and communicate it very quickly. An example would be, if you only have $1 to spend, you must spend it here. See what I mean? So take something that you believe in that's an opinion but state it in a way that it feels like it's fact. So that would be, that's how you would do it with power. With passion, you would create a lot of online conversation, getting people to participate. You would want to share how they're going to feel when they participate in the webinar. With mystique, you would say, we're going to have a special guest, but we're not going to tell you unless you come. With prestige, you would say, you would either, you could either say, that you, if, if you attend the webinar, that, you, um, that you're going to have a certain type of result, like a prize, or you would have a guest, like, say, for example, a Seth Godin, but my gosh, who could ever get Seth Godin to come? <laughs> 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 Alarm would be to say, we're only going to allow 10 people to come to this webinar, but you have to log on first. With rebellion, you would explain to people entirely new ways that you were going to show them how to do their business. And finally, with trust, you would have to have a long-standing relationship with them that you would tap into over time. So that's an example of how to use, and thank you, Flora. It's an example of how to use the seven triggers for advertising a webinar. There they are again. Hello, guys. So how would you use this in, in, in Twitter? Well, I, I did an interview with Chris Brogan. And I thought, well, wouldn't it be kind of fun when I put this interview out for, for my Twitter followers? Wouldn't it be fun, instead of just doing it traditionally, how could I use the seven triggers? So this is what an unfascinating tweet would be like. This would be the traditional way of doing a tweet. I would say, I have a new guest video, and then I would have the link, right? I mean, this is kind of how it would normally go. Well, how could we apply the seven triggers? Well, if we applied power, or passion, rather, if we applied passion, 
It would say, filmed at a gorgeously grand hotel, this interview with Chris, this interview reveals the charmer in Chris Brogan. Or I could use a tweet with alarm. Only the first 10 people who retweet this tweet will get to watch my interview with Chris Brogan. I could use power. Chris Brogan, the interview. <laughs> with trust, I would tap into my relationship with my followers. Of all the videos I've ever shared with you, this one with Chris Brogan will be the one you'll never forget. Please retweet. So I'm sustaining the relationship. With Rebellion, I would make a joke about a com the conversation I had with Chris. See what kind of hot mess we got into. With Mystique, I wouldn't let them see it. And then with Prestige, I would say, I got an interview with New York Times bestselling author Chris Brogan, and you didn't. So this is how I did it on my blog. I asked people to vote. Not surprisingly, rebellion always wins. I mean, this is like, if, we, if, we have, if, if you learn nothing, learn that rebellion always wins. Okay, so let's talk about you. After we talk about this nice cold bottle that Brian brought me. So in 2010, in 2010 when Fascinate came out, we developed a personality test. And since the test has come out, We've had 70,000 people take the test. So we have an incredible amount of data that we've learned what makes a personality fascinating. And just in case you didn't do the test, let me give you the, the quickest version that I possibly can. This is my business card. And these are the seven triggers. And so I want you to find the two that you think are you. And then, I said to my team, you know, our whole point is that we make things fascinating. So you have to make the most fascinating business card the world has ever seen. And it turns out, you know, if you spend a dollar a business card, you can do some pretty awesome stuff. <laughs> okay, so here, over the course of 70,000 people, here's what the average result looks like. So it's pretty even among the seven triggers. Now last week I was speaking at the Fortune Growth Conference, which is um, high power entrepreneurs, mostly, mostly C-suite. And here's what their, their formula looks like. As you can see, they're all about power. But now, here's you. Look how high you people are on passion. Look at this. And then over here on rebellion, it's one of the highest uses of rebellion that we've ever seen, which makes sense. Passion is all about creating connection, creating emotion. Rebellion is all about creativity and change. Maybe it's just a coincidence that I respond so strongly, but my combination is passion rebellion. So I feel as though we're all kind of one. Now, this is what I want you to understand about your combination. Your personality brand defines some of the ways in which you see the world. But more importantly, it defines the way in which the world sees you. It defines, it, it demonstrates how other people are likely to perceive you. So for me, for example, I am not good at the alarm trigger and I'm not great at the trust trigger. I don't fascinate that way. And you can go back in my life to my math class in seventh grade and they'll be more than happy to <laughs> concur when I got a D plus in math, there's a fine line in math between being creative and being erratic. I will continue to support Sally in using her creativity in becoming more consistent in her work. <laughs> Clearly she did not know I am passion rebellion. So I was not good at math. And here's what I want you to think about. If you have kids, I want you to think about your kids. Because the way in which your kids fascinate defines that they're not going to be fascinating in other ways. I was not fascinating in math. Didn't matter how hard I tried, I was not going to be able to do it. And thank God I didn't try to become a mathematician. I went instead into being a copywriter and being a creative director and going into advertising where things like passion and rebellion are valued so that I could become more fascinating. One of the, um, I'd like to show you an example of, of passion and rebellion at work. My client, um, Dolce & Gabbana, they had a particular challenge because they needed to be able to create sunglasses that were fascinating. And I'd like to be able to show this to you 
this commercial to you, but it definitely uses the rebellion trigger. Is everybody okay with that? Okay. Dice, are you ready with this? Okay. <laughs> I just want to send that to my math teacher. So when I was 27, I opened up an advertising agency in Venice Beach. It was named Robert and Hogshead, and, um, and, I, and, and I loved Venice Beach, but I mean, we all know Venice, right? I mean, and this is when I was 27 when Venice Beach actually still had some sketchy cred. You know, there were actually real gangs still living there and not just boutiques. And we, we would schedule conference calls and we could literally hear the gang fire outside the windows. So, yeah, I'm not, I'm not exaggerating. We did have Bloods and Crips. So when Robert and Hogshead opened, we didn't have any money and the only thing that we could afford was Helvetica and going to Kinko's. So, so we Xeroxed a map of Venice Beach and then we went to Kinko's, and here's what we did. It says, there's the bloods are the red, <laughs> crips are the blue, and then see that little tiny yellow spot? That was Robert and Hogshead, and the headline says, we've moved to a neighborhood that works as late as we do. <laughs> so we sent this out to potential clients, and here's what they really got. If a client wanted to have an advertising agency that had marble washrooms and ferns and brass, we were probably not the right agency. But if they wanted fearless ideas that were going to be courageous, then maybe they should come over. But some of them called and they were kind of nervous. And they were like, well, do I need to wear my bulletproof vest? So we sent out uh, something to hang on their rearview mirror, which said, please don't slash my tires. I'm visiting Robert and Hogshead. <laughs> and then on the back it says, of course, we can always meet in your neighborhood. And then it was the holidays. <laughs> so I lived in Venice for 11 years. And I loved Venice. But there was a very hard time that I went through in Venice, a time in which I was pregnant with my second child and I was unemployed. And every day when I went, when I went to my house, there was a sign that was stenciled on the wall and the sign said, remember who you are. It was done by a graffiti artist. Remember who you are. And I was pregnant with my daughter, Azalea. It was a very difficult pregnancy. And I thought about that all the time because my whole identity had been defined by working and being a creative director. And so to be pregnant and not able to work because I was on bed rest was one of the most difficult things I've ever experienced. And a month ago, I came back to LA with my daughter, Azalea, and we went by the sign, and she took this photograph of me. <laughs> remember who you are. And that's really what fascination is. It's about remembering who you are. And so when, we, when, when I created this idea of a company that was around this, the tagline is, we make you fascinating, and we create different ways to help people become fascinating. And we do things like, we create cool stickers that you can put on things to demonstrate the ways in which you fascinate other people. We're creating a line of t-shirts. But one of my favorite things that we're going to be doing is we're launching howtofascinate.com, and, and I, I, this is what I want to be able to share with you tonight. I've never shared it before, so you guys are, are my, my little insider sneak peek. At How to Fascinate, what we learned was we took all this study that we had done with these 70,000 people, and we found that we could go much deeper than this. We could go almost like a Myers-Briggs or a Strengths Finder, and we developed a new test. The test is much more in-depth. It takes 20 minutes, and at the end of the test, we can tell you your top five strengths of persuasion, the top three ways that you're most likely to turn people off or push people away, your leadership strengths, and why people are going to fall in love with you or believe you. So here, for example, is what that looks like. This is Brian Elliott's report. Brian is the change agent. He's power and rebellion. 
He uses power and he uses rebellion. And this describes what that means. And this is what his combination looks like based on his results of taking the F score. His competitive advantages, his pitfalls. But at the end of this, what we did after we looked at all of these different personality types is we realized that we could chart them out. We realized that we could take these different personalities and we could predict how they were going to persuade and how they were going to influence in any number of situations. So here's how this works. You have a primary trigger. Your primary trigger is the way in which you're most naturally persuasive. So if you use the power trigger, that means you're going to be your most persuasive when you're persuading with power and authority and expertise and control. But you don't just have a power trigger. You don't just have a primary trigger. You also have a secondary trigger. The secondary trigger is much more important than we realized when we originally developed the F-score. What we've learned at How to Fascinate is that the secondary trigger actually plays a major role in which how somebody is able to captivate others. The secondary trigger lays on top of it. So your primary trigger is here, and your secondary trigger goes across there. And this is how we can start to dissect the different personality types. So let's take a look at power. These are all the different power types of personality. If we go through and we see, well, what would, what would power passion be? That's kind of a Richard Branson style. It's called the ringleader. The, the, the ringleader is motivating, vigorous, compelling, optimistic, and brave. But like every personality type, there's a downside. And the ringleader's downside is they tend to step on toes. They don't even realize they're doing it, but they have such a big personality that it, sometimes they can kind of get into other people's space. Then. There's the Guardian, which would be like a Warren Buffett type. They're very established, genuine, sure-footed, traditional, and stable. But sometimes they play it a little bit too safe. Then there's a mastermind, somebody like a Mark Zuckerberg. Private, methodical, intense, complex, and independent. But they can be perceived as aloof or disinterested. Just like we never know what's going on at Facebook. We never know what's going on inside that walled garden. They don't tell us. We have to guess. The maestro would be somebody like a Giorgio Armani, ambitious, discerning, focused, well-groomed, but occasionally daunting, can even be intimidating. They can be so focused on the result that they don't necessarily focus on the people around. The final authority <laughs> <laughs> would be somebody who has a very overbearing personality, who's an alpha dog, rigid and accomplished. Now, I don't want to talk to a power plus power personality brand at a cocktail party, but if my taxes went south and I needed to hire an attorney, you can bet that I would want a watchdog or a final authority. Then there is Susie Orman, the watchdog, power plus alarm, <laughs> inciting action. If you want to get people to move, you want somebody who is power plus alarm. <laughs> the change agent would be the patron saint of creativity. It would be Steve Jobs, somebody who's entrepreneurial, who's somebody who sees a vision that the rest of us wouldn't necessarily be able to see. So these are all of the different personality types. And what I want to do with you now is I, wa I want you to start thinking about your personality brand. And take out your sheet. I think you, you all have one here. And a little bit we're going to be going through an exercise. There's something, that, um, there's something about this matrix that I want to I wanna tell you that's a little bit of a secret. If you look at the matrix, I want you to look at what happens when we go on a diagonal. The naked heart, the old guard, the deadbolt, the last word, the final authority, the neurotic, and the anarchist. These are all the same, the same trigger twice. So passion plus passion, power plus power, mystique plus mystique. What happens when somebody has too much of one trigger, it becomes too extreme, it's too overbearing. It's almost like it's one dimensional instead of being two. You need two personality triggers to help balance each other out. I'm, I'm relieved to say that nobody in this room is any of these. Otherwise, I would have had to cut this slide out. <laughs> but you know, if we, if, we, if we look at it, here's, let's take a look, let's slice it a different way. Let's take a look at what happens if we, if we talk about passion. Now, passion people have a real gift for immediately intuiting what other people think. 
They can read body language. They can instantly feel what the other person is feeling. They can create emotion in the other person. And that's what makes them most persuasive. But if it gets too much, then they become the naked heart. The naked heart is almost like, you know that person who comes into your office, they're like, oh my god, you hurt my feelings. <laughs> like they're like a raw nerve ending. It's too much. <laughs> it's too much of the passion trigger. So we don't necessarily want that. But these others can be very, can, can be very compelling. And th there's a combination that I noticed that was, th there were a lot of you in this room, which is passion plus power or power plus passion. I want you to understand the difference because in a minute, I'm gonna ask you to identify your personality brand on the chart and your alternate. So if you are a passion plus power, your alternate would be power plus passion. So I'm going to be asking you that in a minute. The difference is somebody who leads with passion, they're, they're, the way in which they are most persuasive is that they're going to be able to bring other people in. Somebody whose power plus passion is going to be more about goals and authority and confidence. You can tell if you're on a team. You can tell if you're on a team if, if, if one person has the rebellion trigger and another person has the trust trigger. It can be very easy <laughs> to identify these two different types because the rebellion person is all about, we can go over here, we can do this, we can change, we can invent, let's do something nobody's ever seen before. And then over here you have somebody who's the trust trigger who's saying, well, let's look back historically. Let's see what, how it's been done in the past. And these two types are not necessarily going to get along on a team. But that's nothing compared to how bad it's going to get if you have somebody with alarm and passion. Because the passion person is going to be all about possibilities and optimism and what can we try. And the alarm person is going to be able to say, but let's make it real. We have budgets. We have deadlines. So you can think about your own teams, about when you put these two different personality types together. It's not that they're not trying. It's not that they're incompatible as people. They just have very different goals. So now what I want to do is let, let's take a look at this whole, take a look at the whole chart, pull out your chart, and I want to talk to you about how to harness the first nine seconds. I'm going to take you through an exercise that I've never done before with a group. So you guys are my beta. And in fact, I should mention that there's one thing that's not on this chart that should be, which is that it's copyright 2011 Sally Hogson Fascinate Inc. Thank you. Okay. You ready? Everybody have your pen out? Paper? Good? Okay. I want to help you create your nine second elevator pitch. This is how can you communicate your value, the way in which you are most persuasive in nine seconds. Like for example, your Twitter bio. There are going to be three steps. Who you are, how you fascinate, and what you do. These are the three steps that we're going to be going through here. So step one on the matrix, I want you to circle what your personality brand is, which is your primary and your secondary trigger. And then next, I want you to circle your alternate, which is the one that's your secondary and your primary. Okay, so this is like if you were passion, power, and power, passion. That's what you would circle. Step two, how you fascinate. I want you to look at those two personality brands that you've just circled and look at the six adjectives there. And I want you to pick the three or four that best describe the way in which you persuade. Does anyone have any questions before we go on? Everybody good? Got your adjectives? Okay, now I'm going to be showing you a list of what you do. And I want you to pick the three or four things that best describe what you actually do in your job when you're being persuasive. What is it that you deliver? Pick three or four things from this list that best describe what you're doing 
in your role when you're delivering maximum value. Okay, everybody good? Okay. Now we're gonna craft your pitch. So you have three things that you've done. You've identified your personality brand. You've picked three adjectives, maybe four. You've picked three or four nouns. Now we're gonna plug this in to create a draft of your elevator pitch. So here's one example of how you can do it. I am the, and then fill in your personality brand, my competitive advantage is Put an adjective and then a noun, the next adjective and a noun, and the final adjective and a noun. I'm going to give you an example. I'm going to give you four examples of how this can go, and then we're going to come back to this slide. So it's okay if you don't have this one. We're going to come back to this. One example of how you could do this. If you were the maverick leader, you might say, I'm the maverick leader. My competitive advantage is my pioneering mindset, my irreverent brainstorming, and my entrepreneurial network. If you were the guardian, you might say, I'm the guardian. My competitive advantage is my established reputation, my sure-footed influence, my genuine relationships. But you don't have to stick to this formula. It's not like this is Mad Libs. You can change it around. You might say, if you were the architect, which is prestige and mystique, as the architect, I can help you build a better future through my exacting standards, restrained communication, and skillful problem solving. Or you might be the connoisseur. Prestige and passion. I'm the connoisseur of my industry. I always delivered astute insight, enviable network, and in-the-know expertise. So now we're going to come back to the simplest way of doing it. And in a minute, I'm going to ask you yours. I'm giving fabulous prizes. So I'm curious to hear somebody's nine second elevator pitch. Who wants to go first? Hi, what's your name? Olga. Olga, it's good to meet you. Let's give Olga a round of applause for reading her nine second elevator pitch. Hi. Excellent. Great. That, you know, my husband is the Maverick leader. And I have to say that that's, that's exactly the spirit of the Maverick leader, that it's entrepreneurial, it's innovative, it's all about creativity, but it's results driven. Thank you so much, Olga. I appreciate that. <laughs> Olga, yes, see me later for your fabulous prize. <laughs> Perfect. Thanks, Brian. 
We already know you're the change agent. <laughs> Who else wants to go? Wow. You get to pick who it is. Hi. What's your name? Angela. Hi, Angela. I'm Power, surprisingly. <laughs> um, OK. I am the ring leader. My competitive advantage is by motivating results, engaging others in self-awareness, and redefining innovation. Nice. Nice. That's great. Thank you. Thanks, Angela. I appreciate it. Cool. Let's give Angela a round of applause. I'm sold. OK, let's do, let's do one more. You get it's your, your dealer's choice. Hi, I'm Jody. Hi, Jody. I'm I am a ringleader. My competitive advantage is motivating ideas, dynamic problem solving, and engaging results. I love that nine second elevator pitch almost as much as I love your shirt. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Let's <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Let's, let's give Jody a round of applause. <laughs> so when you can start to tap into what your advantage is, you can start to communicate yourself immediately. You can start to communicate yourself in a way that breaks through this nine second barrier. And the, re the, the rewards of being able to say who you are and why you matter and what you do and why people should care, the rewards are huge. In fact, the rewards are so great that you can attract the prospect, close the sale, and build a long-term relationship. Now, earlier we were talking about a guy named Ed, and things were looking kind of grim for Ed, because all he had to compete with was high. But let's just imagine, just hypothetically, what if we took Ed's profile and we did something a little bit different? What if his profile said, I have a tan on my teeth, and I can easily see my belly button. I read books without pictures, I watch movies with dialogue, and I don't consider KFC an ethnic food. I'm looking for a girl who appreciates the finer things in life, but is willing to settle for me. It's pretty fascinating, right? I think that's enough to attract the prospect, close the sale, and build a long-term emotional relationship. Would you like to see the results of Ed's marketing campaign? Thank you. Pink is my natural shade. I just go red for, for you guys. And then we did a ceremony with our kids. Who can count how many kids we have? More, more, eight. <laughs> it's fascinating, right? So here's what I want to leave you with. You don't learn how to be fascinating you unlearn how to be boring. And what I want to encourage all of you to do is that when you leave here today, I want you to go back and I want you to find that part of yourself. I want you to find that part that you locked up in a box when you made that decision a long time ago and I want you to bring it out and I want you to use it and I want you to apply it. Not just in your work, not just with your clients and your consumers, I want you to use it with your kids and with the people that you love and all the people that matter to you because those are the ones that you want to fascinate. It's the people that you love most in your life that you want to persuade, that you want to hold close, that you want to connect with, that you want to have this intense emotional relationship with. I'm so grateful to you all for coming tonight. Thank you very much. We're going to take some questions now. If you'd like to do a little Q&A for just for a couple minutes. Raise your hand. I'll come around with the microphone. Right here. Since you have eight children, I'd like to know how you figure out the triggers for your kids. 
Well, we ha we, they've all done the F-score, but what I've found is that the F-score doesn't really work with kids who are under 12 because it asks questions like, people who've known you for years, how, they, do they know everything about you? And as my son, who's 10, pointed out, I haven't known very many people for years other than you. <laughs> but we're developing, a, um, we're developing an F-score for kids. So, the, so right now, How to Fascinate is all about a professional assessment, and then we're doing a version for romance and love, and then we're doing a version for family and kids. Uh, Hi. Hi. Uh, my name is Marika Hensel. Hi. Hi. And I was wondering, actually, um, if you are using several triggers simultaneously to fascinate? Yes, frequently people use more than one trigger, but if you put them all together, it's kind of like when you, when you're, when you're, see, I've done finger painting. Did I mention that I was really good at finger painting when I was seven? When you put all the colors together, it's just kind of this brown mushy thing, and it's kind of the same thing with triggers, that if you try to do them all together at once, it's a cacophony. Each trigger has a different result, and so you want to make sure that you're choosing your trigger in order to achieve a specific desired result. It's kind of like, if you think of it like a set of tools and each trigger is designed to elicit a certain type of response, you don't want to do them all at once simultaneously. But right now, as I'm talking to you, as I'm, us I'm using power in which I'm, I'm an authority and I'm telling you the answer, but I'm also using passion that I'm bringing you into my message. If I were using mystique, I'd probably be over here like this. <laughs> you see what I mean? Hello. Hi. Uh, the question I had re regarding the uh, dormant uh, trigger, I, I right. didn't hear anything about that. So is well, let's talk about okay. it. Okay. So your dormant trigger is one that you're least likely to use. If you're in a situation in which you need to persuade and captivate, whether it's writing an email or leading a meeting or doing a new business pitch, the, the trigger that you're least likely to use to persuade somebody else is your dormant trigger. My dormant trigger is trust. That doesn't mean that I'm not trustworthy. It just means that somebody isn't going to buy into my message and be captivated by me because of trust. But somebody who is trust-oriented, they project a certain calm. They, they have an ability to make other people feel at ease because they give this sense of sure-footedness over time. That, that, it's not that I couldn't do that if I tried, but it would be artificial. And so that's not, that's not why somebody would be fascinated by me. A couple more? Hi. So how would you determine which trigger to use when you're um, trying to motivate a large group of people? For example, a webinar or email campaign, how do you decide which one because you're covering so many people? Well, so let's take, let, we'll take two or three just to give you an example. If you want to push people really quickly to do something, you would want to use the alarm trigger. They're not necessarily going to like you, they're not necessarily going to respect you, and they're definitely not going to become repeat customers because you're giving them an impetus, like a rock bottom sale, or you're threatening them, or you're, you're giving them a, a huge problem that they have to grapple with. If you said to somebody, um, or our, our doors are open till midnight and we're going to slash everything by 50%, you might get a lot of people coming into your store, but that doesn't mean they're going to come back on Sunday. They're only coming because you incited the alarm trigger. On the other hand, if you use the passion trigger, those people would become your advocates. Those people would become not only your fans, they would actually become deeply emotionally embedded in your brand and they want to, would want to talk to you. The problem is passion is much more expensive to do. Passion takes an actual commitment and strategy and ideas and dedication and it requires devotion on the part of the brand to be able to elicit it. Whereas alarm is really cheap and easy, which is why most retail advertising does not create a long-term emotional connection unlike most brand advertising like Nike uses, which is much more expensive to do. Thank you. Couple more. Hi. Uh, hi, Sally. Mitch Jackson. I hi, love Mitch. your book. Just fantastic. Oh, thank you. The game changer. Um, my challenge is I'm a trial attorney, and I have uh, the challenge of fascinating 12 people in a jury box that <laughs> I've, I've never met before. And it's under very artificial conditions. Yes. In other words, we have rules that we have to follow. And do you have any suggestions? Is there such a thing as group fascination? Can you can you read twelve people and and make a blanket, you know, uh, gut feeling about are they power, passion, trust? How do you how do you push those triggers? Well, actually, Mitch, did I mention I have a husband named Ed? And Ed is a trial attorney. 
And so I have had a lot of experience with figuring out how do you fascinate 12 people. And we're actually talking about releasing a product that would be Fascinate for Attorneys. You know, like we're doing um, Fascinate for Teachers, Fascinate for Salespeople, et cetera. But Fascinate for Attorneys would go something like this, or Trial Attorneys especially. If you want to be able, normally a trial attorney would stand up there and they would either use power, or they would use trust. So the problem is that so expected in, being able, in, in doing it, you would either use authority and expertise or you would use you can believe me because I know what I'm talking about because I'm a good guy and I have a track record. But what if you used prestige? You would use prestige by bringing in expert witnesses, by having a, an opinion that's, that's, that's elevated. You would you increase the value of everything that you say. You would use rebellion by challenging the jury, by getting them to think in a different way, by doing exactly opposite of what they would expect, which would be really great over the course of a long-term trial so that they're not getting lulled into it. Or you might use alarm by heightening their fear of what if this could happen to you? What if that was your child in the accident? What if this was your mother that this happened to? That you could, you could raise that and immediately create some kind of a response from them. And, uh, and in doing so, hopefully win the trial. Thanks, Mitch. I just wanted to say that I'm really happy Brian found you because I am wowed by you. Thank you. And oh. I just drove two and a half hours to be here. Yeah. <gasps> Yay! So, like, I'm so glad I didn't miss the whole thing. Thank you. What a nice thing to say. I appreciate yeah, that. Yeah, you're amazing. Yay! <laughs> Even the speaker agrees. <laughs> One more? Okay. Olga? So you spoke about that moment that you could remember when you lost it. I'm curious about the moment where you found it. Hmm. Hmm. I've never been asked that before. I, I think, as a woman, I think that there are a lot of ways in which we don't want to stand out. There are a lot of ways in which we want to have the right answer. We want to have the right haircut. We want to have the right clothes. And the problem with being right is that most of the time it's wrong for ourselves. That we spend so much time trying to be better than somebody else that we get in lockstep with their game instead of figuring out our own. And for me, I was a really late bloomer. That took me a really long time. Advertising was a huge part of that because when I went into advertising, I realized that I could, I could take all these ways in which I saw the world differently than other people, that I wasn't good at a lot of things. I really was not good at math. Good at finger painting, not good at math. And I could, and, and I could start to apply this, and I got external acknowledgement. And this is kind of what I mean about the power that we have when we tap into our natural hidden strengths. When you can find and isolate and express and amplify who you already are, you gain power, you become more fulfilled, you become more valuable, you become more loved. Because you're taking who you already are and becoming more of that. Instead of trying to become somebody else's idea of who you should be, like my math teacher. So for me it was discovering what it is to be a catalyst, what it is to be a passion rebellion, instead of trying to be trust or alarm or one of the other triggers. Thank you. I've got goosebumps. <laughs> back in the back. <laughs> Was it you? <laughs> uh, my name's Fred Ebert, and I'd like to know where I could buy a four ounce bottle of your passion and energy. <laughs> 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 oh, oh. No, you're an aerial photographer, right? I don't know if you could fly with it. Might be, it might be illegal. Isn't there like laws against that? <laughs> I have an answer. Isn't it at howtofascinate.com? It's it, yeah, thank you very much. Howtofascinate.com. Yeah, actually, howtofascinate.com launches in um, I think three weeks, and we're about to open our first round of beta testing. And so, if you if you want to be in um, if you want to be in the beta test, please sign up and let us know. Let's take one more. Last one. I don't have the book. I really want the book. 
do I buy the book now or do I wait till 2012 for the new book? <laughs> and do you have any here right now? Because I'm in. Well, I love it that you are. You can download it instantly onto your Kindle. <laughs> it, uh, I would go ahead and buy the book and know that it's going to change. And you know what would be really great? You know what I should do? Is that for people who have already bought the book, I should do, I should work out with the publisher so that they can immediately get a free either download or email PDF of the new information. I mean, that would be a very social media-ish thing to do, wouldn't it? Okay, we're gonna do it. I'm gonna call the publisher, I'm gonna say LinkedIn, linked OC told me that I should, and I'm going there. Um, I, you know what? I, I have to say, I loved writing this book. I loved finding these stories and discovering this concept and uncorking it. The book is very different than what I've talked about tonight because what I wanted to give you is more practical, hands-on, how do you actually use this stuff? But the book is much more of an exploration of the way the process of the brain science of fascination and marketing and, and how that works. And, and uh, if you, I, I would love to have a copy that I could give to you, but I think you might enjoy the book. I do branding and marketing. So is it going to change enough that I should buy both? Well, I mean, I'm all for buying both, but <laughs> I would say just buy two now. All right, <laughs> okay. Thank you. That's every author's favorite question. Should I buy now or should I buy later? Anyway, listen, I gotta say, this really is a huge honor for me that you came out tonight. I'm so grateful to you. I'm really eager for your feedback on what you think about ways that I could improve this because like I said, it's very much a work in progress and this is the first time that I've introduced it before and um, I'm gonna be sticking around. I'd love to be able to talk to all of you tonight. Thank you again so much for coming. Thank you, Sally.